So I'm Maria Pisani. Um, I'm an academic, an academic activist, I generally define myself as. And for the past 20 years, I've been quite involved um, in, let's say, political work in, in Malta. Um, and I was not aware that I was present for the first um, Pride. I thought it was the second, but I was there in 2004, um, which coincided, I think, with me engaging more in, in, in these social justice issues, let me call them social justice issues. Um, so in, in relation to, to LGBTIQ+, but also in, in relation to asylum seekers and refugees, women's issues. And it was in 2004, at the end of 2004, that I had set up an NGO um, together with Sean and Mario to specifically address um, issues related to social justice and marginalized voices. Um, and that is how I started to get engaged as well um, on this issue. But I think I would also describe it as my own sort of renaissance, if you like. I was involved um, as, as, a, as a young person in the UK. I had already engaged on these issues. Um, but when I came back to Malta at the age of 17, I became silent, was silenced. I'm a, probably a little bit of both. Um, and so I had my own journey um, of sort of losing myself and finding myself. But then when I found myself, I found myself with, 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 um, with a lot of energy and ready to, to start looking at different issues. Many of my friends who are out today were, were married back then. Um, and, and I had other friends who were out but did not want to attend. Um, it's, I think it would be wrong of me because it, this was not mine, it was theirs, and, and, I, and I feel uncomfortable speaking on their behalf. I think it's enough for me to say that I knew. You know, it was something that we didn't really speak about, but, but it was very obvious. I mean, of course it was obvious. Um, it, I could go, they couldn't go. And it, it was as simple as that, I think. <laughs> and as complex and painful as that. So at the beginning, I sort of felt that it was, um, that, that we were perceived as problematic. And, and um, I can remember actually walking in, I can remember it really well, walking in Republic Street, and um, a neighbor saw me and I watched her eyebrows shoot up and I was recently separated. And I remember thinking, her, her, I think when she looked at me, her, 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 um, what I think went through her head was Malalek. <laughs> Malalek separate. And I remember just laughing, it wasn't the case at all. But there, there were these connotations of shame still. And, and like I said, for me it was, not an issue, and, and, and that was my privilege, um, and, and something um, that I became aware of. But then slowly the energy, actually quite quickly, the energy shifted. Um, so if I look back on photos within five years, I think, um, I remember there was one in Slima. I can't remember what year, because originally it was in Valletta, and then there was one in Slima. I think it was done at a different time of the year as well, because it was scorching hot, but by then the energy had changed, and it was starting to feel more, not just defiance, but also celebration. Um, whereas at the beginning, there was not much celebration. And there was a lot of resistance. I've always, I mean, there are many ways of describing the Maltese context at that time, but the word that always comes to mind is constipated. You know, I mean, that's always what I used to always say, Madonna is constipated. And anything outside of that dominant norm was that dominant narrative of Malteseness um, was deemed as problematic. Um, now, it wasn't just on issues related to sexual orientation and gender identity. Well, actually, it was sexual orientation more in, in those days. Gender identity hadn't even really emerged as the narrative. But also, uh, we started to see these you know, issues related to race and ethnicity, this attack on Maltese identity, which was conflated with Roman, um, the Roman Catholic identity and the teachings of the church. church. Look, th they were very particular times. The, I think in many ways, even related to, to women's issues, um, this was not a time of protest. 
the, the, the island was kind of um, almost intoxicated by these open borders and, and products were flowing and you went from um, people used to go abroad to buy toothpaste and chocolate and that was like Mansi Boucher now, Mansi Boucher now and suddenly the market's open and people sort of celebrating and happy with these economic shifts and social issues were sort of ignored, these um, social inequalities were ignored um, across a, a number of different issues. And then in the early 2000s, we started to see these narratives re-emerge and push back. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't easy. Um, and, and it was very much a small voice at the beginning, a very small voice. And many of my friends who were out at the time were not prepared to go to Pride. They were, they were not gonna go. Um, it was actually a very small number. So in 2023, I, I went to Europe Pride, um, but not just the, the, the march, also to the conferences, um, to a number of events actually. Um, Cool Queer, I remember as well, that I loved, and my daughter participated in that one. Um, and I was quite pissed off that I, she had asked me if I wanted to, and I was like, no, I'm too busy. And then when I was there, I was like, I really miss that. I would have loved to have been a part of that. Um, and the conferences um, that were less about how far we had come and, and more about what needs to be done. And lots, there's a lot more that needs to be done. Um, look, life is full of contradictions, yeah? Um, and you can hold different contradictions together. So, you know, I, I, absolute joy at the, pri at, at the Pride March. I, I danced all day, um, loved every second of it. And at the same time, a sense of frustration, sometimes disgust with um, political discourse. Um, when I see how certain populations, LGBTIQ plus populations are treated, um, in particular, in my case, asylum seekers and refugees, which is where I focus, um, and the contradictions there, how lives, I don't like to use the term rights anymore. I, I, I fight for, for human rights, but I feel that they have a, they can be disembodying. Um, when we talk about violating rights, we're violating people, we're violating people's lives, we violate people's bodies, we violate who they are becoming, their dreams and their hopes. And, and so I hold that joy together with this despair, if, if you like. Um, a friend of mine, went to Pride and described it as um, the happiest day of his life and, and that fills me with joy, the fact that he could be there and celebrate with his partner and, and, and be authentic and, and be himself. I mean, how can we not celebrate this? It's, it's amazing and it, and it signifies, you know, the, the journey and how, how far the, the community and, 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 um, and the struggle has come. So you can, you can hold these different truths together. Um, and I think it's important to, to stop and to celebrate and to recognize you know, what has changed and also acknowledge and, and, and allow that to, a sense, in a sense, I suppose, give us the energy that, that we need to, to continue to fight. I was at Corquia watching with Gabby. I was stood next to Gabby at the time, who I've known for years. Um, we also studied together. Um, and I, I could see all these people, you know, there was hundreds of people and there was joy. Um, and I said, uh, you know, probably many people here don't even know who you are. Um, <laughs> I knew who she was and I knew how difficult it must have been at times, not just for Gabby, but for many people. And I think it's important that we, we acknowledge that. It's different times, huh? Sorry. <laughs> I mean, allyship is always important, but, but beyond that sort of political realm, I mean, life is political, but, but on a day-to-day -day basis, um, and I suppose this doesn't just apply to the LGBTI community, it, it's, you know, there are other intersectionalities, and um, to be aware of your privilege, um, even as a gay person, um, to be aware 
of other privileges that you may enjoy. So I, I don't want to sort of diff you know make this distinction either. Um, not to be sucked in or taken in by a political discourse that is all about celebration um, and that sugar coats or pink coats, pink paint, the, 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 uh, or the pink washing that, that, that we see on a day-to-day -day basis, um, to listen, to be aware, um, to look. You know, we're all in a process of becoming and we all face our challenges. Um, and, and also in a process of self-discovery. Um, nothing is clear and sometimes this can be painful. Um, so to listen, I think, to assume nothing and to listen is a good start just as, just, you know, as a nice human being. Um, and to be ready to speak, um, to, to speak truth to power, to, to have uncomfortable conversations, um, to defend, to witness, to bear witness, to bear witness to other people's struggles. Um, I think that's always important. We evolve. Um, it's important that we also understand that we're still on this process of discovery. So it's not job done. It will never be job done. And today we are able to to understand things that we didn't understand back then, inclu including within the LGBTIQ plus community. And even as a straight person, even my own ideas about you know before I say oh I'm straight, but I'll, I'll, I'll you know not but and I will be there. But even my own identity of of of, of my sexual identity. I, I, today I understand it also as evolving um, and, and so I think it's important that we push back as, as well and never assume that we now get it, that, that, that now we're on top of things. I, I, I think there's a danger that comes with that kind of arrogance. Um, so we're constantly learning, you, you know, you never put your foot in the same river twice, everything is constantly shifting and we need to shift with the times and as we, as we become more aware of, of how we are evolving as well, as individuals, as communities, and, as, and um, within the global and the national and the regional context. So I think that's important um, that we never sort of assume job done and, and, and we can pack up and go home. Well, they call it the struggle and it is a struggle over time. And, and I think that's why the community is important as well in, in supporting each other. Um, my friend and colleague um, Marceline told me recently that I, uh, and, and, I'll, and I'll quote her here, this is Marceline Naudi, academic and also activist and fellow unicorn feminist. Um, she said that she heard that she, I used to think it was a sprint and, and then I thought it was a marathon and today I understand that it's a relay and I think that is also part of that struggle um, and, and your different energy levels and you, um, what you gain and what you learn and what you lose in the process and the importance of passing that knowledge on. Um, not in a sense of look at what I've learned and, and, and I know better than you, not at all, you know, but passing that on so that the next individual, the next group, the next community can take that knowledge and make it their own, shape it in a way that makes sense for them as well. So I think part of, of that exhaustion is also knowing that, that, um, that you are part of something much, much bigger and we stand on the shoulders of those that came before us. We need to take those moments to recognise um, where we were and, 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 and where we are now and, and where we are going. It gives us energy. Um, it, it gives us hope. And, I don't like saying buts, I need to stop saying but, and to recognise and acknowledge how much we need to do. Um, to look again at what is going on around us, to see how injustice is experienced in different ways by different people, um, to recognize our privilege and to, to take on, I think, in, in the most humble of ways, I, I, I hope, um, 
the role of supporting each other in, 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 in this fight. But I think a sense of defiance. Um, but again, I, 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 I wanted to root that in what I was going through at the time. Um, uh, I'm in my own personal journey. So a sense of defiance, and I knew that I was there for others that couldn't be there. Also as a role model for my kids as well, who were also involved. Um, Shauna has been involved as well um, in campaigns, in a, in a campaign in, in, in the past. Um, it, it was important. I, I felt it was important, and, and, and I think there was that sense of defiance and, and um, ultimately because I believed in it you know I believed in the importance of it and and um, and I, I was aware or um, as aware as I could be I think of the work that needed to be done and 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 we had a pretty good idea even then of, of the changes that, that that we needed to see I was also involved with um, a network called ASA Mobility in the, in the early 2000s as well. And this was work that was being done in Europe um, in relation to HIV AIDS and migrant populations. And there was a strong intersection in terms of the LGBTIQ plus population as well, community as well. And, and there I met some amazing people um, who worked hard and played hard um, and, and I was I felt really grateful to be a part of, of, of that movement as well. I learned a lot as well. It, I mean I think perhaps it gave me um, the courage I think being part of that community gave me the courage and the strength not to mention the knowledge and the skills that I needed to also work on other issues that, that uh, I had sort of pinned my badge to, if you like, um, in particular in relation to asylum seekers and refugees and also in terms of the women's movement that was quite silent at the time. Um, and then uh, over the last 10 years, we, we sort of found our voice as, as well. Um, so, I, you know, there, there are these different strands that, that are also weaving together. Neil Faltzon from Aditus as, as my work husband over the, over the years he's been um, we've been to many marches together um, we've had many conversations together um, and and he, he's been an, an important role model as, as well and somebody that I bounce ideas off and and um, I, I, it's even strange if I go to a protest and he's not there. If I, if I don't see him, it, it's, it's a bit bizarre. So, I, you know, there, there's been a number of individuals, and, and there still is uh, over the years, that have been very much a part of my journey, and I think I, to a certain degree I've been a part of theirs. Over the years, I've met many people from the LGBTIQ plus community that, that, that arrived in Malta as asylum seekers. Um, and, and it's very frustrating when you see this, you know, celebration the most gay friendly country in the world and and that is not the case when it comes to people who are who are fleeing persecution based on 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 their sexual orientation we place them in detention for months at end expose them to violence um, brutal violence sometimes we fail to protect them on on almost every level i would say and um, so what changes would i like to see where do you start well, with something like this? Cut the crap. Um, if, if, if this is really what you stand for, then, then, then let's see it um, across the board and not just those people with a vote. When you are really invested in human rights, you see the human, not just the voter.